All right, we are back with BCV Live here at the Hilton Anatol Hotel in Dallas. I'm here, I'm very pleased to have Jessica Savage with us. Jessica, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely, yes, I'm Jess Savage. I am uh, head of distribution for Exos Trucks and I've been in the trucking industry for 13 years now. So worked in all parts of the industry and really excited to be here this morning with you. Thank you for being here with us. Of and course. I had a conversation with Jess prior to this interview and I got to you know spend more time to learn more about you and what you do and part of our conversation that you know I, I remember it now and it sticks out to me is when you told me about your professor. Yes. And may, can you tell our viewers kind of how that professor almost got you to, you know, being in trucking today? Of course. Yeah, huge mentor of mine, um, still keep in contact today. And I was in school and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And, you know, nobody really, I think there's a, a lot of folks who are born and bred into trucking and I, that's so exciting and the history that they have there is just phenomenal, but I didn't have that. so. Being in trucking is not like a dream come true to me. Right. <laughs> and so as I was thinking about what I wanted to do, this specific professor who came out of Penske Rollins and the industry in general had said, you really should go interview at Navistar. And I said, what is Navistar? Do like they pay all. well? <laughs> like, how, what is this process? Right. And he said, just go do it because the industry needs more women and they need more women who are outspoken and can carry and, and help mentor others throughout the industry and their career paths as well. Which I, of course, was extremely proud of myself in that moment for that. Still was like, eh, trucking, so, yeah. you know. And I went for the interview and so many parts about the company were amazing and the longevity of everyone who's been in the industry and just doesn't leave, regardless of whether right. they hop around a bit to a few different companies. Um, so I took the job when they offered it to me and like I said, 13 years ago. Never History back. ever since, right? <laughs> exactly. I've heard from so many people that you don't choose the trucking industry. It's like it almost chooses you. So true. And it's in a good way, it's like a black hole that yes. once you get into it, there's no way of getting out. <laughs> but um, along with myself, and you know, it sounds like the same with you. I think a lot of people's expectations of what the trucking industry is like is very different to then once they get into it. Totally. And um, I'm, I think we all have that mentor or that professor or, you know, that boss that may have helped guide us and kind of, you know, push us to where we are today. Yes, so I'm, exactly. I'm glad you have that person to Thank get you. you here. Absolutely. So tell us why, why, so what so what is exos trucks exactly and why do your passions why is it important with your position at exos sure of course so at exos we are a oem manufacturer for fully electric commercial mm -hmm. vehicles and so we have full breadth of product from class five through eight and currently have step vans out in operation in customers hands today and the reason why i felt really passionate about coming to exos was i got into e-mobility a bit when i was still working at mac trucks mm -hmm. and i started to see a lot of need in the industry for all-encompassing solutions. You know, selling electric vehicles is not just, here's your truck, here are right. the keys, ready, go. Which is what I, that's my comfort zone, mm -hmm. I was ready for that. And as I started to see the journey into e-mobility and really the impact that it had on the environment as a whole, the more I thought, they really have something here. And so I joined, um, you know, a startup experience. It was, it's been really great for me. I've done a lot within the company and the industry space that I wouldn't have had the options or ability to elsewhere. But it also gave me the ability to really learn a lot more about where the industry is headed mm -hmm. and what applications we can start with for that and really how to create a purpose-built vehicle for certain customers and very specific applications in the last mile as well. So something we had talked about in our previous conversation is with, you know, pollution and things that are contributing to climate change. Um, a lot of that goes into redlining. And I would love for you to tell our viewers what that is, why electric vehicles can help to end redlining. And yeah, just kind of tell us what it's about. Yeah, so we take it back a ton of years, back to the 30s. and. Redlining was an actual practice that folks would do to essentially cut certain uh, ethnic groups, neighborhoods, and races out of access to mortgages and lending. Right. 
and there's a lot of research that goes into the background. And of course, we're not here to talk politics, we're here to talk right. to us. But what led as an outcome of a lot of the redlining practices of the past that's kind of led into a little bit of that today is access to what some may call just basic needs. So internet, you know, a lot of the spots where uh, folks were forced to live because of redlining practices are low-income housing properties, yes. near landfills, they're near water treatment plants, and recycling plants, all of which produce a mass amount of pollution. Um, even in my little neighborhood in Los Angeles, I have uh, almost weekly need to dust off my windows because right. of the soot that comes from just mass amounts of cars on the road. And in California, we're actually quite progressive as it comes to uh -huh. EVs on the road. And so when I start to think about those things, I really feel an impact to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis in trying to help combat some of those, you know, decades-long issues that we've faced as a result of some of the practices that we all used to take. And I think um, in having certain applications for electric vehicles and where you'll see all truck OEMs starting with right. rolling them out, last mile, refuse, um, door-to-door -door deliveries. Those are the really impactful things that hit people's neighborhoods, mm -hmm. in their homes, and every little bit counts right now to right. be able to mitigate a lot of that impact. Now we had talked about, you know, you are very passionate about this, but you said that not every situation may need electromobility. So why do you think that? And can you give us some examples? Absolutely, yeah. It would be great if every situation could have electromobility yeah. today but the technology just isn't there. Um, on top of regulations for weight and all of these other options, and it's really difficult to be able to have electromobility everywhere. We can't put it on long haul routes. So we would have too much of a payload offset to be able to do that. So as the technology grows, um, and there's a lot of great folks here at the show this week talking about autonomous driving and all of these really cool ways to revolutionize the industry. Mm -hmm. So as technology grows, the number of applications that suit electrification will grow. Um, but for right now, really last mile, port operations, and um, some pretty tight refuse applications, these are all going to be really perfect for electrification today. Right. Now, I have just found out from our director that your ba your uh, mic is on low battery, so we're oh, going to yeah. switch it out real perfect. quick so we can keep going. <laughs> Cool. All righty. There we go. I mean, <laughs> that's kind of how broadcast is. It's live. It's and, true. You know, Never a There's life. no sugar coating to it. So, and I, I didn't expect that we had to go in that direction of redlining, but you know, it's something I, I told you I've studied about. Yes. And it, it's been part of my uh, own experience, and uh, it was refreshing to hear that you understood it, you knew about it, and. Um, how do you think we can educate and bring more awareness? Um, because so so many people don't know what redlining is. They don't understand that slit. Like you said, you're absolutely. That's a, that's because of climate change and the pollution in the air. So what do you think we can do? Absolutely. I think the key thing, first and foremost, is to give folks access to the right information. Right today, you can find an answer to support whatever it is you believe in, frankly. And I think that really the core of any journey with with electrification or with climate change has to do with the topics that are really important and impactful to you. No matter what you believe in, no matter what side of the house you play on, there's something that's impactful to you that I would guarantee that cleaner air has a purpose in. And that's something that's really big and near and dear to my heart. Um, not pushing agendas, not throwing yes. people into spaces that they don't have a passion for. Um, but if anybody has kids or grandkids, they want to make sure that Let's say they develop asthma one day because the air is so intense that they're not able to play outside. Those are things that we don't want to have to lose as a, a generation to come, the ability to go run outside because we don't have access to clean air. So it feels intense. It's a really intense conversation, but it's the reality of where we play today. And I think that 
a lot of what we do in transportation is really focused around bringing people what they need to thrive in day-to-day -day life and that's inclusive of clean air and I think when we think about everyone delivering medical supplies and goods and the things that we bring people on a day-to-day -day to enhance their lives what we miss a little in that is clean air and what it takes to deliver those goods as well. You know with something like COVID it took a pandemic like that to let the let the world know that you know truck driving is an essential business yes. and drivers are essential to our industry absolutely and at the same time help uh, truck drivers already have health problems yes so, um, there's high risk for diabetes uh, high cholesterol high blood sugar and also bad air I mean not having clean air yes. and being around trucks that are producing this, it's, I don't think it's going to help benefit what we're trying to solve with truck drivers health either. No, absolutely. And the healthier folks are, the more safe they're going to be. They're going to not cut corners. You know, when inherently you have electrification and you have other alternative clean fuels, you're also mitigating the steps that it takes to be ready to go in the morning with pre-trips. There's a lot fewer moving parts and components there. So it gives everybody a better chance to actually be able to show up safe to work. And that's also another really big thing. Let me ask you one more thing. Um, what is the safety and the reliability with these electro mobility trucks? Yeah. I mean, some people are totally against it. Some people are like, yeah, let's do this thing. But truly, what, how reliable are these trucks? Absolutely. So the reliability of the vehicle and the chassis themselves are no different, um, arguably better. So you've got anywhere between 40 to 60 percent fewer moving parts on the chassis. And so you have your typical standard brakes and other componentry that is common with traditional diesel or gas vehicles. But for the majority of the vehicle, things aren't moving as much as it was before. So you have a lot more reliability there. The batteries themselves, it's new technology. So no one has a crystal ball that says nothing bad will ever happen or you'll never have to replace this. But what we do know of is that from an overall impact to the environment and process, in the event that a battery reduces down below its intended state of health, we can remove the battery packs in their entirety, replace them, get you back on the road. Like I said, the chassis is going to last its typical 15, 20 years, maybe even longer, if depending on the application. And so you're just working with the batteries. Similar to you get to a point where you may have to do an engine rehaul. That's a week or two of work in a shop if they have somebody ready to go and dedicated. Whereas with the batteries, you can remove them. Um, we at Exos have a partnership to remanufacture batteries, get them back on vehicles or get them used in other applications um, such as battery storage for charging. Um, but other OEMs are also creating their own processes for that as well. So it's just a slower and easier process for degradation in that. It also very much depends on your application, how often you're charging. And so the reliability and safety of the battery technology is very similar. I think what a lot of people miss is there's not a lot of information out there about it. Um, we all hear all the bad news about things, so if something lights on fire, everybody sees it, but when something performs without any fault, nobody hears about it. And so it's those types of events that the more vehicles that are out on the road, both passenger and in commercial, we'll start to see a lot of uh, the same type of safety talks and safety discussions that we do for diesel vehicles as well safety components on an electric vehicle outside of don't stick your hands in anything that's orange okay. we make it very clear <laughs> as to what you should and shouldn't touch but same thing you don't want to you know lead over with your long hair and exactly. front of a flywheel so it's things like that that we just need to make sure we're informing folks of um, first responder training is one thing that we really pride ourselves in at exo so it was one of the first things we developed and an easy system to be able to say something is going wrong i'm going to disconnect the high voltage batteries yes. all of them in one foul sloop so friendly. exactly right? it's very simple we try to keep it as simple as possible because not only is that important but mm -hmm. our industry is also younger and it is you know less a bit mechanically inclined we've lost some of the um, older workforce who were really used to really diving in and doing pre-checks because they had to. I think COVID also laxed some of the safety things that we had and that we were focused on just simply out of need. And so it's getting back into regular safety practices, but making them easier as well.
Jess, thank you so much for coming thank on our you, show Bryce. today. I'm so happy that you got to share some of your knowledge with our viewers and myself, and I hope everyone else watching can take away from this that thank you. all of us can do something, whether or not we're in the trucking industry or we're just someone living in, you know, the climate change that we're that we live day to day with. You know, there's something we can all do. They are small yes. and it's all going to contribute to something. So absolutely. All right, thank you guys. We'll be right back with another interview and some fun talk.